As we walk out the journey of life, we each begin to thirst for something more. We want more than just life the way we know it. It's a thirst for more peace, more fulfillment, more purpose. That was God's plan all along. Since the ancient times, he has made promises that he will quench that thirst. And the promises he made long ago are the same promises he has made for us today. Welcome to Radiant Church. My name is Andrew and I'm the lead pastor and we're so glad you could join us today from wherever you're watching or listening from. If this is your first time joining us, hey, go to RadiantChurchSC.com, click I'm new. And if you fill that short form online as a way of saying thanks, we're going to donate $5 to one of the nonprofits that's listed right there. Well, we're in our third week of a series of talks called Four Cups. It's based on what we call the core uh, four promises of God, okay? Now, these four promises comprise the DNA of who we are as Radiant Church. They have their roots with the people of Israel during their days as slaves in Egypt. And these four promises are forever commemorated in the four cups of wine served at Passover. They're found in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. And this is God speaking to Moses here about what he's going to do for Israel. So take a listen, okay? He says, Therefore, say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will set you free from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm in my acts of judgment and I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. So each I will statement that God makes is a promise. His first promise to Israel is that he'll bring them out of Egypt because I will bring you out of Egypt, he says, okay? His only concern is getting them out. He's not concerned about changing anything with Israel yet. He just wants to get them out of Egypt. And the reality is the only thing God is concerned with you at first is getting you out of darkness. You don't have to change yourself and straighten your life out to get to God. You get to God first and then let Him change you. That's the first promise, by the way, the promise of salvation. Talked about that last week. But today, we're going to spend time in the next promise, the promise of deliverance. So after God promises to get Israel out, he promises to set them free. Now the change really begins to take place like right here, okay? So all Israel had ever known was slavery, Egyptian culture, Egyptian gods. They had no idea how to live the free life that God had designed for them. So <clears throat> God has to set you free from your old life, right? Your addictions, the things which keep you from truly living free. That's all you've ever known. He has to show you how to live the free life that He's designed for you. Now there's two other promises as well. I'll just touch on them real quick. The third promise is the promise of rest so God says, I will redeem you to Israel, right? And to redeem something means to restore it to its original purpose. So Israel had a divine purpose they hadn't been living up to, and, and God was going to restore them to that purpose. And he wants to do the same thing for you too. And we're going to talk about that next week, all right? And the final promise is the promise of fulfillment. So once God had gotten Israel out of Egypt, once he'd set them free and restored them, he then makes this statement, I will take you as my own people. You'll never know how true truly great your life can be, how fulfilling it is, okay? Until you're with a group of people, a community, making a difference. So God wants to save you. He wants to free you, restore you, and fulfill you. And these aren't promises just for Israel, okay? They're available to each and every person. So if that Jesus fulfilled each of these promises himself, and we place our hope in Christ, uh, you know, these promises become available to us too. Now, I don't want to presume that every one of you guys watching or listening here today knows the story of Israel and the Exodus. So let's take a moment to get all of us on the same page, okay? God gives Moses those four promises prior to him leading Israel out of Egypt. So what happens next is that God will send ten plagues, okay? Each plague is an attack on multiple Egyptian deities where God shows that not only is he more powerful than those Egyptian gods, but he's also the real God, right? And then Pharaoh lets the people go. But Pharaoh will change his mind and he deploys his massive army to stop Israel from escaping. One big problem Moses and Israel are going to run into, they got Pharaoh and the army behind them, right? 
right? But the Red Sea is actually in front of them. So they're trapped, or so they thought. So God tells Moses to, be, to go out to the sea, and he parts the sea, okay? And the people cross the other side of it, and as Pharaoh's army is racing down after them, the sea swallows them up, okay? So Israel is now free, and that was the first promise. But for 400 years of slavery, that's all they had known, right? All they had known, Egyptian deities and Egyptian culture and food and lifestyle and language. And it, it takes about 11 days to get on foot from where the Red Sea is at to the borders of Canaan, and the, you know, which is the promised land that God was going to give Israel. But it takes them about a year to make the trip. Now, why it takes so long? Because God knew that once he got the Jewish people out of Egypt, he had to get Egypt out of the people. That, that life was all they had known. They needed to undergo a transformation. He needed to change what they ate and how they talked and what they wore and how they lived. He needed to show each of them and teach them how to worship and follow him, to learn and depend on him. There was a, an entire transformation that had to take place in the lives of the people of Israel. See, once God frees you and he saves you, then he has to change you. And the problem is, you know, you, you, when God sets you free, you don't know how to live a free life, right? So like you're, you're no longer a slave, but you're still thinking like a slave. You're still acting like a slave. You're still living as if that once dominating influence is still dominating and controlling you, right? So you don't, you don't know any better. <laughs> You've never been free before. So what God has to do once he's gotten you out of Egypt, he has to get the Egypt out of you. He's got to transform your life. And so a transformation it affects the entire person, right? Your, your mind and your spirit. So your mindset is inherently flawed and completely human. It's dominated by your emotions and your cravings. Your spirit is the part of you which is like God and, and lives forever, okay? When God saves you, and that's the first cup, this part of you, your spirit, becomes perfected. But your mindset hasn't changed. Your mind still thinks and acts like a slave even though you've been set free. And that's precisely why there are so many Christians who love God, who are saved, yeah, but they're still struggling with their sin issues, right? Their mindset hasn't changed. They've been saved, they've been set free from their oppression, but they're still thinking and living and acting like a slave. So how do we change our mindset? We have to allow God to complete the work He started within us, right? He brought us out of darkness, now He's got to set us free. He has to deliver us from our slavery. So how does God change our mindset and deliver us? Well, here's the thing. It starts first with God giving us victory over sin. So what exactly is sin? Sin is falling short of God's standard, okay? Our world's in chaos. Like right now, what's wrong is, 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 is now right and what's right is wrong. Every person wants to create their own truth and define what's right in their own eyes, but the ultimate standard for what's right and wrong doesn't rest with imperfect people like you and I. It actually rests with God. God's standard alone is what we measure by, and we've all fallen short. Romans 3.23 tells us that, right? It says that everybody has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. But sin is also what you do to yourself, okay? You harm yourself. You inflict pain on your own life. And here's the kicker. In an era where no one wants to assume personal responsibility for anything, we want to blame people for our problems and our predicament and where we are. The truth is, you don't need other people to help you sin, it's not their fault. They didn't cause you to do anything. In fact, you don't even need the devil or demons or whatever it is you want to come up with to help you sin. You can sin all by yourself, dude. We're fully capable of doing that without any help because it comes natural to us, okay? Now, here's the hard truth today. If you love God, you cannot continue in a life of sin. You just can't. If your heart's truly, fully, completely devoted to Him, you cannot continue to knowingly and willingly and purposefully sin. And yet we all cave to sin's temptations, don't we? It affects all of us. We can't resist it. You know, every time we're faced with temptation, we give in a lot of times, right? So what's the answer? Because that, doesn't that mean that like none of us are capable of you know, being devoted to God? Well, listen to what Paul says. He's one of the greatest church leaders we've ever had in the first century. Listen to what he says about his own struggle with sin in Romans. Romans 7, chapter 7. Okay, He says, I've discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what's right, I inevitably do what's wrong. I love God's law with all my heart. God's word is what he's saying here. Okay, But there's another power within me that's at war in my mind, and this power makes me a slave to the sin that's within me. What a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that's dominated by sin and death? Hey, here's the answer. Thank God the answer is Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is in my mind. I want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. 
So Paul says, I love God's law with all my heart, right? That's the spirit right there, the, what's been saying, the prophetic the talking, okay? I love God's law, God's word. But there's another power at work within me that's at war. There's a battle raging forever for Paul's and your mindset, okay? God wants to change it. Even you want to change it, right? Paul's like, in my mind, I want to obey God. But there's this real enemy out there who wants to keep you in that enslaved mindset. This battle and struggle between the spirit of God within you and what Paul calls our sinful nature is taking place, okay? So then Paul asks a question which every person at some point in their spiritual journey needs to ask, okay? Who will set me free? Who will free me from this life dominated by sin and death? Who's going to give me my, you know, my, my mindset here of victory over sin, he's asking. Thank God the answer is in Christ. Nothing else, just Jesus. See, victory over sin comes through Christ. Victory over your sinful nature and habits and struggles comes through Christ. Later, Paul's going to write in Romans 12, too, that our mindset is changed when we allow God to transform it. Victory comes through Christ and no other. Not a political party, not a movement, not a person. Only through God. So we're given deliverance when God gives us victory over sin, right? But God also delivers us by providing healing from our wounds. Now, I believe in divine healing and that God can heal you physically. But I'm speaking here in terms of emotional and mental wounds that many of you carry. If, if sin is what you do to yourself, right? And it's a, a wound is something other people will do to you. So what happened wasn't your fault. Someone abused you. Someone harmed you. Cheated on you. Maybe your heart broke from an unexpected death or tragedy. You didn't ask for these hurts, but they've been, you know, they, they've created wounds wounds in your life. They have inflicted deep pain and harm on you, okay? If you don't deal with the wound, you know what happens? An infection starts. And, and it starts in the wound. And then it, and if it's not addressed, it'll spread all throughout your body. It'll cripple your body before ultimately destroying it. Listen to me. Some of you have wounds right now and you don't want to address them. But you must. Because ignoring the wounds will keep you in an enslaved mindset. It'll cripple you and ultimately destroy you. If you don't deal with your wounds once and for all, it, you know, it, it, you'll get stuck in the second promise right here. And you'll never see the next two. And that's the enemy's plan, I think, for every Christian's life, by the way. He knows that God sets you free. That's the first cup, right? He, he's doing all he can to make sure your mindset never changes. You never live a free life in Christ. You still live as if you're a slave and he'll use as many people as he can to wound you so you stay stuck in that enslaved mindset. Set. Why? Because he knows the next two promises are how God will use free people to change the world. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. It tells us this, that we should not let anger control us. Why? Because the anger gives a foothold, Paul says, to the devil. So a lot of us, you know, we live our lives right here. Our wounds give way to anger and bitterness and a whole host of emotions. And we give the devil an inch and he stretches it into a mile that keeps us enslaved. So we struggle to let go of our past and the wounds that people inflict on us. Us, right? But if you don't let go of the past, you'll never see the future. As the Jews are wandering in the desert on their journey, they found themselves at times stuck in the past. They, the past seemed better than where they were at the moment. You know, it's like, hey, Moses, we, we had garlic and meat and houses and beds all back in Egypt. You know, they would complain all the time about this kind of stuff. And of course, they forgot they had those things, but they weren't free. They were slaves, man. The journey from where God found us to where he's taking us, it's not always exciting. I wish it was, but it's not. Sometimes it contains long stories stretches of desert and we don't know why God's choosing that route and we don't know why things aren't looking better and if we're not careful we'll stay stuck in our past because it seemed better and we'll never see the future. We'll get stuck in the desert between our deliverance and our destiny. It all starts in your mind. You have to allow God to transform your mindset before you get to the promised land. God's deliverance gives us victory over sin, healing from our wounds, and finally, authority over the enemy. We've already talked about him, but just so you know, you got a real enemy, a real devil. And I know that sounds a little crazy, right? So some, some, so few people, I think, genuinely believe in a real actual devil. He sounds like a myth or a legend. You see him on TV as a, the fictional character in Lucifer. You see him as a cartoonish figure with a pitchfork, you know. But the truth is, he's real. 
and he's dangerous. 1 Peter 5, 8 says he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for people to destroy, okay? So in order for you to break free, you have to let God change your mindset. That means you also have to learn to take authority over the devil. If God saved you, if he sets you free from the enemy's enslavement, then the devil's got no power over you, man. Live a life of victory. That life is yours today. Remember Paul? Paul, a few minutes ago, we were in Romans chapter 7, and Paul got real, and he got transparent, talking about his sinful nature. And in the next chapter, he'll tell us how we can, you know, not only have authority over the enemy, but specifically how you can walk in the freedom that God wants to bring in your life. So look at Romans 8, 1 and 2 real quick. Paul says, so now there's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Paul, by the way, is right a Christian here, okay? And he starts by saying that God's Spirit doesn't condemn us any longer because He's freed us from the power which leads to death. He's given us authority over the enemy. And there's a distinction that Paul makes a little bit further in, in verse number 5. He says, those who are dominated by the sinful nature, they think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Spirit, they think about things which please the Spirit. So if you're a Christian, okay? and you're still dominated by your sinful nature, you haven't allowed God to get the Egypt out of you, your mindset hadn't changed, you haven't been transformed, you're still living as if you're a slave, and until you let the Holy Spirit control you like what Paul is saying, you'll always be a free person who still lives a life of slavery. And my oldest son started sleeping in his own bed a few years ago. It was a brand new experience for him, okay? All he had ever known was the confines of his crib. And I told him, I said, hey, Ezra, all right, in your room, when you get up, stay in there, okay? You can play with your toys, you can get your books, but you need to stay in your room until mommy or daddy comes to get you. And for the next eight months, I kid you not, he would not leave his bed. He was free to get up and go anywhere in the room. He knew he could leave his bed at any time, but he still acted like the bed was a crib. He placed limits on himself, the limits that I actually freed him from. See, until you allow the Holy Spirit to control you, you will place self-imposed limits on the purpose and potential that God has placed inside of you. Christ defeated the enemy, man. He took away the limits. He's given you authority over the enemy, over the devil. So take it. Let the Spirit of God change your mindset and start living a free life. Once God has freed you, living the free life, like, how do you stay free? And this next part is entirely up to you. See, God can't do it for you. So let me ask you a question. <clears throat> what has the most control of your mindset? It's not God. It's, it's not the devil. I'll tell you what. It's actually the people you run with, your, your influence, okay? People influence you far more than you want to imagine. In fact, the old, the old statement, show me your friends, I'll show you your future, that's really true. And, and what this tells me is that relationships are the key to drinking from the second cup and living out that promise that God has for you. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. He takes care of our sin. Let's check this out from James chapter 5, okay? Confess your sins to each other, James says, and pray for each other so that you may be what? Healed. See, the right people in your life that can actually heal you. Go to God for forgiveness, but go to God's people for healing. If you get around the right people, they will strengthen you spiritually. It's God's recipe, man. Ever noticed how God never talks about you by yourself? All throughout Scripture, we read that you're in things like the family of God, the body of Christ, the flock. Why? Because you were not designed to do this alone. Your relationships impact your mindset. And when you get your relationships in the right place, you grow and you change because a key element of the transformation that God wants to bring to your life is getting you in the right community and with the right relationships with his people. If God has saved you, there's three important steps you need to take, okay? First step is this, it's water baptism. It doesn't save you any more than really my wedding ring that I got on right here makes me a, a, a married person, right? What my wedding ring does is make a public declaration that I have a new association. I am married, okay? Baptism is your public declaration that you are associated with Jesus, taking your faith public. So you believe first, then you let everybody know to get baptized, right? Here's the next step you gotta take. Go through Growth Track. Growth Track is a two step process. The first step helps you discover who we are at Radiant and how you can become a, a part of the church community. The second step, 
It helps you learn how you can use the gifts that God has given you to make an eternal difference. And if you're not local and you're watching or listening, we're working to get that online for you guys. But for you guys who are local, the first two Sundays of every month, you got to go through it. Here's the third step, a little bit up in the air because of COVID. We haven't moved to starting physical groups yet because of the current surge in our area. Our, our, our part of the, uh, of the state is one of the nation's worst with COVID right now. So it won't be this way forever, but eventually we'll launch physical groups. So right now we're kind of chilling because of COVID, but groups are where we make and build and surround ourselves with the right relationships with people. You need people to help you walk through life. You got to build healthy relationships with people who can you know, help you practice the things we just talked about, okay? You need to be in a group when we launch them. Now, if you're not local, many of you watching and listening right now, you're not. I want to encourage you to be part of a strong local church where you get involved in. Now, if Radiant is your church, you consider us your church, then make sure to reach out and contact us because we want to help you set up a group wherever you might be located and kind of walk through what that's going to look like, okay? Those are your next steps, though. If you, you know, I want you to take those next steps if you haven't already because here's what has to happen, though, right now in the next few minutes. I want transformation to start for some of you. Because for some of you, this message feels like it was just for you. Like you, you almost like you got singled out. You know, that's God's conviction, by the way. And he's saying, hey, it's time for you to start living a free life. I've done the heavy lifting. I've set you free. I've given you victory over sin. I've brought healing for your wounds. I've given you authority over the enemy. But I need you to accept it and live it out. Are you ready to start living a free life? That's the big question, right? First, if you never accepted Christ before as your Lord and Savior, we gotta take care of that right away. So I'm gonna walk you through a two-step prayer, which will lead you to, to, to just that, okay? So we make Jesus our Savior first, meaning he saved us from our sins. Then we make him Lord, which allows him to guide us and direct us. We don't call the shots in our lives anymore. He does, okay? And then next, we'll pray for God to transform your life and deliver you, giving the victory over sin, healing from your wounds, and authority over the enemy. In fact, I'm praying for every one of you right now this will be true in your life because some of you haven't started living that free life yet. You're still stuck in sin. You've not been healed from the deep-seated wounds holding you back, or you haven't exercised the God-given authority you have. And so today is the day. And I pray for transformation for you, man, so you can live in the freedom that Christ brings. So let's pray. Father, I love you. I thank you for every person watching and listening right now, whether they be local or, or, or not. Lord, I pray for those who are saying, today's the day I start my transformation by saying yes to Jesus. In fact, if that's you today and you just want to say yes to him and follow him for the first time, we're going to do this prayer right now, two-step prayer. First thing we're going to do, and I want you to pray in your own words, okay? But the first thing we're going to do is we're going to ask Jesus to save us from our sin. And so you say a prayer like this. Say, Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. Please forgive me for the wrong that I've done. Forgive me and cleanse me from my sin. I pray that you would just make my life brand new. Give me a brand new start. Wash me. May I not be a prisoner to darkness and sin any longer. May you set me free. That first promise is the promise of salvation. May you set me free. Bring me out of darkness, Lord, I pray. And forgive me of my sin. And now that we've done that, <clears throat> we're going to make him Lord of our lives. And how we do this is we just say, Jesus, I surrender my life over to you. I'm not going to call the shots. I'm not going to follow myself anymore. I'm not going to be in charge. Hey, I'm giving everything over to you. you. You know me better than anybody else. You're my creator. And so I want you to lead me. I want you to guide me. I want you to make the right you know, de decisions and directions that I need to follow. I, I, I'm, I'm submitting myself today to following after you. And, and I'm, I'm through doing my own thing. Be Lord of my life. I'm going to obey you from this day forward. And so what we've just done now is we've made him Lord of our lives. And so we made Jesus Christ Savior and Lord. And the Bible says that if we have done those things, if we confess with our mouths, believe in our hearts, that he's Lord, we're saved, and you're part of God's kingdom. But your journey is just beginning. We need transformation to take place. And so I pray, Lord, right now for every person out there that they have yet to experience transformation. Lord, I pray that you will set them free. If there are Christians who are struggling with sin, if they haven't been delivered yet, Lord, I pray for victory over sin. If they're struggling, God, because they have deep-seated wounds that are filled with anger and bitterness and, and, and all kinds of just pain that's been inflicted on them, Lord, I pray they will let it go. 
a God that wouldn't live in the past and move forward in the future you have for him, and they let that go, that God, you'd bring healing for their wounds and set them free. And Lord, I pray that if they are struggling to have authority over the enemy, Lord, if they are still living in these self-imposed limits, God, I pray you'd realize, or help them to realize that you have set them free. There's no authority the enemy has over them any longer. There's no limits on their lives anymore. They are set free today. God, I pray for this transformation to begin in each and every heart. May, may those who are watching and listening here today, may they truly begin to step into the free life that you have for us. We pray this all in your name. Amen. Amen. Hey. Congratulations to you guys who prayed to accept Christ today for the first time. And for those of you who are praying along with me, you're believers, man, but you're praying for God to set you free. Hey, that's a big deal to admit that I, I need Jesus. It's, it still is. I don't care how long you've been following Christ. It's a big deal to sacrifice that self-pride and say, you know what, I, I, I need him. I haven't been living a free life. I need that. And so congratulations, guys. God's bringing transformation to your hearts. You're on a, a brand new journey, man, that, that's going to continue the rest of your life. And in fact, I, I want to hear from you. And so if you're watching or listening, man, and God's impacted you in any way, shape, or form through Radiant Church, hey, go to our website, radiantchurchsc.com. Click share your story. You can find that under our connect tab. Click share your story, man. We want to hear your story, how God's changed you and impacted you here today, man. Have an amazing rest of your day, wherever you're watching or listening from, and we'll see you again here next time. Jesus Christ who calls the dead to life Call me from my guilty